Recently, I was over in Malaysia with the first ever Oppo Ambassadors meetup and present at the launch event for this, which is Oppo's second generation foldable. It's called the Find N2, and it does have a 5.54 inch outer screen, which is a standard width to it. And it's very easy to type on this outer screen, unlike some of the competitors out there, which have narrow screens. Because it's a little shorter, I do find it's a lot more comfortable to handle, easier to pocket, and great for using the inner screen for typing too, with the more squared off aspect ratio to it. So when you do open it up, you presented them with a stunning 120 hertz AMOLED screen, which is 7.1 inches, great for multitasking and gives us a lot more extra space. So in this review, I'll be going over what it's like to use this foldable phone here, the good, the bad, and what is the performance like? It's powered by the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, and my model that Oppo sent out to me has a huge amount of RAM, so 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage. Inside the box of the Find N2, you'll find our charger. It is 67 watts. I'll give you the exact charging time later on that I get. We have a type A to type C cable. They do include a case. Now, because it's a foldable, it's in two halves. So we have this one with some little adhesive strips along it to keep it on it. So that's gonna protect the outside screen and the frame. And then we have camera module sides of the other half protection and the back of it. Now it's a little bit hard to come out on camera here, but uh, this is a synthetic leather, fake leather that they have on the back of that half of the case. They do include a microfiber cleaning cloth to wipe down the inner display, some paperwork that is in Chinese, and then our SIM tray tool. Oppo is the only brand so far that's gone with this shorter form factor for their foldables. And this is my first time testing it out because I never got the original Find N and it actually works. I am really fond of this because it just makes the phone a little bit more comfortable, comfortable to hold it one-handed, fits in your pocket a little better. So a standard kind of phone size here is like this. So quite a bit taller. This is the iPhone 14 Pro Max. And with this foldable being just a little shorter, I like it, and especially when you use this inner screen. So the inner screen here, this is, and there's the fingerprint reader on the side, that works really well. This one is 7.1 inches, and it's a very nice screen, really bright. I'll get onto it a little bit more detail. What I really like about this form factor being a little bit more squared off is that typing especially is so good on this keyboard. So I'm currently using a Gboard here with it. Typing is great, and I find that I can just type so fast and quick. Now the same applies to the outer screen, which is 5.4 inches. Now using this one, you'll see that, okay, I've got it unlocked, but I needed to swipe up. There we go. It's just as good typing on it because it's the normal kind of phone width here. So it's not like a Z Fold 2, 3, and 4 that's quite narrow like this, and I hated typing on those foldables. Uh, this one is great here. So for typing on this, great. I really like it. Okay, it's really easy and just makes it usable. So I can reply to WhatsApp messages, to text messages, all from the outer screen without actually having to open it up. So following on now with the design still, we've got 32 megapixel camera right here. There is actually one in the inside too as well. So we're not missing out on an inner camera. You can place your video calls and use the inner screen there, which is handy. The fold mechanism feels very good. Really do like it. And when you close it, there's a very satisfying little noise there. And it has magnets that keep it closed. Now the screen is closing, of course, completely flush here. There's no ugly gap for dust and stuff to get in there. And then those people in the comments that say, well, it's touching, the screens are touching. They're not actually, because there's about a half a millimeter uh, height to that bezel around the outside. So when it's closed, there's about a one millimeter gap between the screens. They're not actually touching, won't be rubbing there, and it's not gonna be an issue at all. So the hinge, really good, feels great. Good, nice metal spine to the back of it with a fine end branding. Top notch, stunning really build quality to it. Down the bottom, two loudspeakers, microphone, there's three in total, and our SIM tray here, this does take two nano SIMs. The Type-C port, this is video out, Spec, it's just cloning the display, so no desktop mode, and it's got the high speed data. So there's another microphone there, and then we have a microphone right here with our camera module. That's the third one.
So they are still sticking with the collaboration there with Hasselblad, with the optimization of the cameras, the colors and everything like that. Two times optical camera, 32 megapixels. The rear microphone's right here, dual tone LED flash. This right here is our 48 megapixel ultra wide. Great to see they didn't just slap in an eight megapixel ultra wide. They actually put a decent sensor in there and a 50 megapixel sensor. Now this has optical image stabilization and an F 1.8 aperture. All up, I think this is some stunning hardware from Oppo. I love this glass coating on the back, the fact that it shows no fingerprints. So this is Gorilla Glass Victus here, Gorilla Glass Victus on the front, and just the whole metal frame. This phone screams of quality. So a bit more on these displays. I quite like this outer screen display. So this, again, is another AMOLED 120 hertz screen like the inner one. And, and it's not quite as bright. This one peaks about 1350 nits, but still you, you can make it out in direct sunlight. Being an AMOLED screen, like these images look fantastic. Touch response is really quite good. I've really had no problems with it. And does it flick it? Now, I can't see any settings anywhere that do state DC dimming going through the menus, which I'll show you shortly. However, I don't tend to see any flicker. So right now I'm at about 50% brightness. I'll lower this down and we'll see a little bit of banding that comes in. That's just on camera. You're not going to see that in person. I've not been able to make that out. So the ultra screen, fantastic. It's got that Gorilla Glass Victus over it and I like it. We've got the hole punch camera on the outside, 32 megapixels. And the same here with the inner screen, which is the 120 Hertz too. So LTPO Tech 2 with it, HDR10 plus. I just show you a couple of demo images here too. The same ones I just showed you. Uh, and you see that it looks even better this inner screen. Now, because of the aspect ratio here, a lot of content, so this is 16 by nine content, you're gonna get these big borders top and bottom, which, you know, they, they don't look so good. That's not amazing. That's just one of the trade-offs with this particular aspect ratio. So great looking colors. And if I just tweak the brightness here a little, you'll see some of that banding coming in but it's the same as the outer screen. You're not going to see that in person at all. Some other options to do really with the screen and this particular form factor, which are much needed options and software optimizations. Uh, we do have the split screen, you've got flexible windows, and we do have the flex form mode, which is a flex mode basically. So this is where you can fold it up. It will sit up nicely like that and then display the app on the top screen. You can have the keyboard down here uh, so very much like the competition that it does have those kind of options. Now, speaking of options, I'll just quickly show you here the display settings. So we've got, of course, our uh, scheduled dark modes, everything that we've come to know and really with Androids all here, screen color mode. Now it's in vivid, you've got pro mode there too. You can adjust the white balance. Handy to see all of these settings are there. I normally run this, the natural tone display, and you probably won't even notice that on camera, but the white now is changed a little bit less of a blue tint to it, but I've got it on the default settings at the moment. Now display size, this is a very handy one. And again, this is something I actually do run myself is small, but I put it all onto standard for the purposes of this video. So we can just see things a little clearer, but I like that option that it's there. So we can take advantage of the display size, the inner size, especially there to take a look at it. Then you've got all your other typical settings in there. Now refresh rate, You've only got two options, sadly. So there's no 90 hertz here. Then just how visible is that crease? So like most foldables, when you look at the screen straight on, which is what most people normally do, you don't see the crease. Uh, you feel it when you run your hands over it a little tiny bit. You notice that, oh, that kind of dips down a small fraction there. Not bad at all. Now this crease is better than a Z Fold 2, 3, and 4. It is no way near as obvious as those creases. And if I just turn the screen off and reflect the light on it so we can see it. So you can see there, you can see the visible crease and I'll just get the light on it a little bit. I can see now, okay, there's our crease. And is it bad? No, I think it's very good. This is one of the best creases I've seen here. I think the best I've actually seen is the find into flips crease. That is almost non-existent. Having the great hardware, of course, is only half the story. We need to have software, especially with a foldable that is optimized for foldable use with this aspect ratio for this form factor. So I'll just launch an app here that I've got installed, which is Safety Net Test. Now, if you're interested, yes, it does get the pass for this, which is great. So your banking apps will be working with this particular phone. 
And now if I run it on the inner screen by just of course opening it up, you see it's sized it like it's a phone screen. So this is the option by default that we get with a lot of apps. Now you got the option here then to run it, relaunch it, and now in what is called the full screen mode. So it's basically running it like in a tablet mode, which is good. Now you can then run this in a floating window. So if I actually go back to that, I can drag it up into a floating window right now, if I wanted to, you can see now it's a floating window. So you can multitask this way. You can launch various different apps, run them all as little tiny widgets, little windows here, bring them up to normal kind of size. Now if I go back into the apps management right here, you can see we've also got another option. For, so I can go here, select this one, and I can run it split screen. I can resize it again if I want to. You have those options. And this is one already. So I'm running Play Store on one side and I've got Twitter here on the other. Now the speed doesn't seem to be affected at all. I've noticed on some other foldables that sometimes when you had two apps, even very light apps like YouTube and Twitter right here, you could sometimes get a bit of choppiness, a little bit of slowdown, doesn't seem to happen at all. And I think it's because I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM with this version that I got from Oppo. So huge, ample amount of RAM. Split screen multitasking like this is what I find is fantastic. Now it's like we've got two phones side by side. The good thing about the UI too is it's going to end up keeping that. So it's not gonna close it off. It'll keep those two apps side by side, remember that. And I have found the multitasking, everything super fluid. I'm running here a forced 120 Hertz. So Color OS 13, as I've mentioned, seems to be really well optimized, very fast, very quick. But because it is an import version, you may see sometimes a little bit of Chinese uh, coming up in some areas, but a lot of it, you can really just remove any of those Chinese bloatware apps you do get in the beginning. But great UI, love the performance, and it does have all of those features that you'd expect and want with a foldable device such as this. As I have mentioned a few times, I have the top spec version here. So we've got 16 gigabytes of RAM, physical RAM, and there's caching. You can dedicate up to eight gigabytes of it, which is the, like, it's like virtual memory, virtual RAM. You're just adding a little bit more to help improve things. Honestly, I don't think it really needs it because it's got the 16 gigabytes, but by default, it's got four there. And of course, powered by the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 and 512 gigabytes of storage. Now there is an update that has come through. It's quite a large one. It's bug fixes, improvements to the cameras, another big area that they've optimized that a little bit more. It's only just come out, so I do expect to see a lot more firmware updates. And Oppo's pretty good with their updates. I mean, my Find X5 Pro, it's probably had, well, off the top of my head, maybe about five updates since uh, I owned that one, so pretty good. Now, Wildlife Extreme Stress Test here. This is very demanding, pushing the graphics mostly at its absolute peak for 20 minutes, so it does 20 loops. And you can see the high score and the lowest. This does confirm that it throttled down the performance 31%, which is a lot. So it does throttle a lot when you game very demanding games like Genshin Impact, which I'll show you soon. You do notice later on after about 20 minutes of gaming that yes, it does drop down performance a little, but it is, it is standard really for this chipset to have this kind of throttling. And I've seen it with other Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 uh, devices, other phones. So the internal storage is UFS 3.1. We still get with that very good speeds here. Random reads a little lower than I expected, but still no one's gonna ever notice that. Uh, it's very quick and snappy. Everything I do with the Find N2 is really quick. I don't see any lags whatsoever. The UI is really well optimized. So the score with N22 with the eight plus gen one here, it's over a million points. Now I've been reviewing now a couple of Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 devices, and they get around, well, 1 million, 200,000 towards 1 million, 300,000. So they are around about uh, approximately 20, 25% faster. But honestly, you don't really notice that performance. You only notice it when you run synthetic benchmarks like Antutu here. So we're not missing out on too much, but it is a shame it didn't ship with that latest, newest chipset. Battery life. So the battery capacity for such a smaller foldable of 4,520 milliamp hours is very decent, good capacity. But realistically, this is a fixed battery benchmark here at 200 nits of brightness. Uh, is okay this score, but realistically, real world use, you'll struggle to get seven hours of on-screen time because of the larger inner screen, because it's very bright. 
and I forced 120 hertz too, by the way, on all of the screens at all time. If you drop it down to 60, you'll get a lot better battery life from it. So the charge time in my charging tests here, it was 37 minutes to go from 14%. Another time I charged before around 10% took 41 minutes. So it's pretty much in line with what they claim. So full charge time, about 42 minutes. It is quick, the 67 watt charging, but of course it's not the fastest out there, but not bad. I don't think anyone's gonna complain about their phone fully charging in around 40 minutes. It's still quick. One other use that I would be using myself would be PDF files, eBooks, things like that. Now I'm running right here, Google Play Books. I have a PDF file here that I've loaded up. And you can see that reading that text now is very good, but when I'm zoomed out, because of this aspect ratio, this is the landscape mode right now, that text is far too small for me. Now, if I flip it around, the text there is a little small. I can read that just fine, but that's gonna tie my eyes out a little bit. So this form factor and the size of the screen almost works like this, but of course you can just double tap zoom into that. Then that's really quite readable do the same when I flip it round into landscape because that's actually that's two pages right now so when you tap and go here you can happily read ebooks like this and it's quite light and very very comfortable to hold because it's short as I mentioned in the start due to this form factor with ebooks I think it's okay I think it's a good device for ebooks and PDF files now I'm sure that this question's probably bound to pop up. What about something like Netflix? The good news is it's got a wide Vine level one cert. So that means streaming DRM apps like this one, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video and whatnot are in full HD. Now I can't really show you too much because of obviously copyright reasons I could get hit with a strike. The quality is good, but you don't really gain that much over a standard sized phone, a normal phone, because of the aspect ratio here. So if I just very quickly show you just a few seconds of this, you'll see what I mean. Because it's gonna come in, and we've got the huge borders, top and bottom. So there they are, those are the borders there. I'm just skip ahead. Okay, it works really well, but what are you gaining? In terms of screen size, not a lot with this kind of content. So that's the downside a little bit to this aspect ratio. Well, actually quite a big downside to it. But what you gain is that multitasking like I showed you before. As you probably imagine, that does also work against gaming too. This is Genshin Impact. Now I'm running it in the top settings with the 16 gigabytes of RAM and the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. This is very good. The performance is great. Now occasionally I see a few little lags. If I game for long extended periods, the phone gets uh, reasonably warm just around this area. Now, it doesn't get up to alarming kind of levels with that heat, which is good because it does throttle. And sometimes you see a few little dips in the frame rate. Now, right now it's close to about 60 frames per second, but it drops off down to the mid kind of 40s. Now they do have their own little game tab here, so you can bring that up. You can take a look at the performance. So that's how I know about the frame rate. You see right now, it's almost 60 frames per second, typical for this kind of spec. Now we've got touch optimizations, a few other things in there um, that you may want to use. You've got all of those options. The big one for me is it doesn't look right, okay? So while the UI is all scaled up correctly here, look at how her character's kind of stretched. It's not right because of the aspect ratio, how it's stretched to it. Now if I flip the screen around, it's even worse this way. So this is one of those kind of annoyances. Now, if you want it to look perfect, then you have to relaunch the game. And this time you'd have to do it, not in a floating window, of course, but you're going to have to resize it and have it at its original aspect ratio, which I'll show you now. So now it is the correct aspect ratio. As you can see, everything looks good. She's not all stretched and looking funny, but we're missing out on utilizing all of the screen space we do have. So you've got those ugly borders at the top there. So I can stretch it out again. I've got the option. So it'll relaunch it. It has to keep relaunching it every time. It does this too, by the way, with the games. Most apps, of course, the native apps and apps like YouTube will scale everything correct. So it's really just watching and streaming like media content, videos, and then games that aren't scaled correctly when it comes to the screen's odd aspect ratio. So YouTube here, it looks good, loads in really fast, and it's all adapted for it. So it's basically like a tablet that it's running it now. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about the audio, but before I do, haptics, very good. Nice, strong little pulses when you're typing on it, especially with uh, Gboard there. 
and I've got no complaints. There's no 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, so you're gonna need that, of course, if you wanna use your old analog 3.5 millimeter. How does it sound? Good. Voice call quality is fine. There is 5G. Here in Spain, where I am, no problems connecting up to 5G. Now, I'm gonna give you a sample of those two downwards firing loudspeakers here. They're loud, hint of bass, and I think they're good. They're decent speakers for a foldable. Moving over to our cameras now with the Find N2. So this is the front facing camera, 32 megapixels. The inner camera is also 32 megapixels. So it does have electronic image stabilization. Now you do have to actually enable it first. By default, the electronic image stabilization is off. There's 1080p maximum with this video, so we don't get 4K with these front facing cameras or the inner camera, unfortunately, just the rear cameras. Rear video now, so this is 4K 30 frames per second. You can shoot in 4K 30, or you have a ultra steady mode too, which is 1080p 60 frames per second, and it uses a very aggressive electronic image stabilization. So you can see the stability as I walk along here in the streets of uh, Kuala Lumpur, just near the Chinatown, which is in the distance here. You can see that it is really quite smooth, this footage. And for 4K, it does not look too bad, quite detailed. Ultra wide video now, still 4K 30 because that is the timeline and what I shoot my videos in. Otherwise you can use 4K 60, a little smoother. And good steady electronic image stabilization. You can also shoot 4K 30 and 60 with the two times 48 megapixel camera, two times optical, and it does have stabilization. Low light video sample here, so this is 4K 30. Starting to really come down here in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, pretty heavy rain, showers. What do you think about those photo samples? I think for a foldable phone, it certainly does well. I like some of those portrait shots of my daughter, the colors I've used, and I think it's got a lot to do with that collaboration they do have with Hasselblad. So it does have, I think, a good set of cameras because most of the time, a lot of brands will skimp out on the ultra wide camera being like an eight megapixel terrible sensor with not really great lens or the outer or inner cameras will be lower resolutions or they could be those under display cameras that just look bad. You don't have that issue here. So we've got a decent inner camera for the screen and the outer camera at 32 megapixels, both of them there are good. Now the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 is now not the latest. We've got the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. So it is a little disappointing that we aren't getting the latest and greatest in this model. The other big one, which is the major for everyone really, is that it's not a global release. This is China only so far, but you can import one in, install the Google Play APK, and away you go. You've got Google Play Store, the framework's there, it has wide phone level one cert, pretty much everything is all there, it's set up, it's great. Now this is a phone that I think is really good to multitask on. If you're someone that runs a lot of apps at the same time and you're swapping the screens all the time, of course, this is one of the key things of why you go for a foldable, is you can run them both, two apps side by side and split screen like that. And it's very handy to do so. You can cut and paste and copy from the different apps. You can be looking at both of them at the same time. And the performance with this version I've got with the 16 gigabytes of RAM, the UI Color OS 13, super smooth, based off Android 13, of course, really good there. And the optimizations, their tweaks for a foldable. 
this form factor are very good. You can scale a lot of those apps up. Now this is where I run into a bit of a niggle here that I think a lot of people will also have the same kind of issue with me is that is that some of the games especially are gonna be scaled oddly. If you run them in the full screen mode, you'll notice that, oh, hang on, that doesn't look right, like Genshin Impact. The characters look all kind of skinny and stretched out because even though the UI all looks correct, it's not the right aspect ratio. Now, some games will eventually be supporting this aspect ratio, but a lot of content that you can't really stretch because you're gonna have edges cut off on it if you don't wanna have the border top and bottom, that is, like Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, any 16 by nine, 16 by 10 aspect ratio stuff does uh, look pretty bad with the bezels top and bottom, the big borders, sorry. And that is an issue that's going to be present on other foldables, but you notice it more with the squared off aspect ratio with this phone. So that's really the downfall of having the shorter device here, that yes, it's more comfortable to pocket it, it's great. It's just that you run into some problems with those apps. Other applications like native apps uh, that are there or apps like YouTube, they run in basically a tablet mode for it and you don't notice that until of course you play the 16 by nine aspect ratio content. So that is the real thing with it. Other than that, it's got very decent battery life for a smaller kind of foldable for the battery capacity. It's not bad at all. Running at 120 Hertz, of course, stunning screens, really good hardware, video out. It's a phone that I believe needs a global release. I think a lot, pe a lot of people will be very keen to get their hands on this if Oppo just releases it in the global markets, in Europe, rest of the world there. So thank you so much for watching my review here of the Find N2, Oppo's second generation of foldable smartphone.